In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God, amen. Today is the last Sunday of Misra, which is the final full month of the Kapta calendar. The gospel reading today has the same theme as the one we touched on last night, and again we'll hear next Sunday, all talking about the end of the world, the second coming, and judgment day. It's a theme we hear every year at this time, and while it might not be the happiest of us, the church places it here for the rest of the world. Talking about the end of the world, death, and judgment day can feel heavy, even depressing, but the church wants us to think about these things not to make us sad, but to help us get ready for what's coming. The more we think about death, the second coming, and the afterlife in the right way, the better we can live lives that please God. Throughout history, people have responded to death in different ways, often with fear, feeling sad about leaving loved ones behind, or just ignoring it together. Some people live as they'll never die and try to get the most out of life in the wrong ways. Thinking they have all the time in the world, but the Bible reminds us that death can come sooner than we could expect. In today's Catholic epistle, St. James says, what is your life? It's like a vapor. In another translation, a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Life is short, whether we live one year, 10 years, or 100 years. Compared to eternity, it's nothing. What matters is how long, not how long we live, but how we live. The church teaches us to prepare to watch and be ready, but how do we do that? The church fathers, especially the desert fathers, give us valuable advice on how to prepare for death in a way that brings peace and even joy. The first step is to remember death constantly. This helps us face the reality that we will all die, and it keeps us from putting off important, important things. Even great figures like Enoch and Elijah, who seem to have escaped death thousands of years ago, eventually will taste death. The Bible encourages us to take the remembrance of death seriously. For example, in Sirach 7, verse 36, it says, In all you do, remember the end of your life, and then you will never sin. The more we remember the end, the less we sin. And we start to see the truth about our spiritual lives. The Desert Fathers made remembering death a daily practice. St. Isaac the Syrian, for example, before he would go to bed at night, would say to himself, Perhaps this night will be my grave. I do not know. While this might sound sad, he explains that doing this prepares your heart for your departure, making you ready at all times. Of course, the Desert Fathers took it to a higher level, but if we can't do it every day, the church encourages us to remember it death regularly at least once a year. This practice not only prepares us for the end, but also enriches our current lives. Besides remembering death, we should also look at what comes on after, heaven. Imagine what it's like, who will be there, what we will do, how we will feel, and the joy of being in the presence of the angels, the saints, and most importantly, our Lord Jesus Christ. The church encourages us to meditate on heaven because it puts everything in perspective. We're not here just to exist here. We're living here so that we can live forever with our Lord. When we do this, we begin to see this world as a temporary, as a tent, as St. Paul describes it, and we begin preparing to take it down this tent for a better home. I remember a few years ago when Marina and I were looking to move to a new house, uh, we tried to prepare Cyril and Basil, and they were not up for the move at all. They were upset, crying, they wanted their familiar surroundings, their rooms, their toys, everything. They just weren't happy with it. They couldn't see why we were making this change. But when we explained and showed them how much better the new house was, more space, better schools, they gradually warmed up to the idea. In a similar way, when we think more about heaven and how much better it will be, we're not afraid to move on from this life. Instead, we look forward to it, knowing that it's the next step. The church teaches us that there is no death, only a departure. It's not the end of the story, but the beginning of a new, bigger, and better one. It's a transition from one place to another, not the end, but a new beginning. As Christians, we see life and death differently. St. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. And about death, he says, to die is gain. Death is a benefit because it brings us closer to Christ, more united with him. It's like the difference between engagement and marriage. Engagement is nice, but marriage is far better. 
The more we think about death and the afterlife, the more we can set our priorities straight, just like the bride preparing for her wedding or the student preparing for his finals. As we read in the Gospel of St. Matthew, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Everything in this life is temporary, but everything we do to prepare ourselves will help us gain eternity. Our actions now influence where we end up later. When we remember where we're going, it changes how we live, whether we realize it or not. Thinking about death in the kingdom of heaven helps us live a more carefully, wisely, and pers pers purposefully life, with heaven always in our thoughts. Let me share with you a story I heard a while back ago. There was once a renowned surgeon who was at the peak of his career. He saved countless lives, was highly respected in his field. His schedule was packed with surgeries, conferences, speaking engagements. He was driven by his passion for work and the accolades that came with it. He often said that his purpose in life was to kill and to be the best at what he did. But one day during a routine checkup, the surgeon received devastating diagnosis, terminal cancer. He was given only a few months to live. Suddenly, the life he had meticulously built, the career he had poured everything into, seemed fragile and fleeting. His surgical skills, awards, and accolades could do nothing to change his fate. Faced with his mortality, the surgeon began to reevaluate his life. He realized that while he had spent so much time focusing on his career, he had neglected the deeper and more meaningful aspects of life, which are his relationship with God and his family. In, his fi in those final moments, he turned his attention away from the operating room towards his spiritual life. He thought to reconcile with what those who, dis who he distanced himself from and spent time in prayer and prepared his heart for what was ahead. This once confident surgeon who had always believed he was in control came to understand the true measure of life wasn't in his earthly achievements, but in his readiness to meet God. As he neared the end, he often said, what is great was, was thinking about eternity sooner. He realized that his true purpose was not just in what we do, but, what, but who we are before God. His story is a powerful reminder that no matter how successful or accomplished we may be, we are all mortal. The surgeon's journey from pride in his worldly achievements to humility before God shows us what truly matters is not the legacy we live on earth, but the legacy we build for our eternity. Our responsibility is to reflect on our lives now, to contemplate on the day of our death and go to deeper into what happens in that day in the kingdom of heaven. We must prepare ourselves for his second coming. The church has organized these readings to help us evaluate the past year, make necessary changes, and prepare to hear that joyful voice saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful in what is least. I will make your overruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord, and glory be to God forever. Amen. The Son of God shall, shall come in his glory and his Father's glory to give unto